I walked in on something and stole some <laughs> <laughs> Dad realized that I was falling out of love with acting, and he said, tell him he can get one of whatever he wants. And that audition came up for me to play a nerd. I locked in. I was like, I got to get this job so I can get a new Sega Genesis. I ended up a single dad pretty early on. And I remember my boy called me out to a nightclub, and four women came up to my car. I'm like, oh, and the baby seat was in the back. I realized I actually want my baby seat in the car more than I want to go out for this night. Whatever it was supposed to happen that night, it didn't go down. No one can conclusively say the Megalodon was killed. Going forward, I just like to be a voice for uniting and breaking down stereotypes that are associated with black men, that are associated with a dad. What is going on here? They have people smelling. <laughs> we want any deep podcast waters here. That was just a taste of our conversation with Jaleel White. But before you get the whole thing, I want you to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. It's one of the best ways you can help support the channel and make sure that more and more people come into the Dad Saves America community. Jaleel, welcome to Dad Saves America. Thank you. I feel like a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> like, who are we going to save? <laughs> We're going to save everybody. I grew up with you, you know, like a lot of Americans. And I want to talk a little bit about how you all got started into television. So when was your first moment being a performer? My mom didn't know anything about the business. She knew nothing about show business. But I had a preschool teacher. Um, and it was, I attended an all-Asian-run preschool in uh, South Central Los Angeles. <laughs> the amount of love that they poured into the, the kids for this school was amazing. Uh, I will always remember Eva Lou. And she told my mom that this kid should be in show business in 1979. And at the time, the only uh, comp was someone like Rodney Allen Rippey, who was doing uh, Burger King commercials, this big Afro kid. And then Gary Coleman would come along after that. So how old are you, the preschool? I, I am three years old. She found an acting school for my mom. And um, I mean, she it, really was like yeah, serious. This, this was no, this was it, it's I love the story because it has nothing to do with analytics. It has nothing to do with um, nepotism. It's just people moving on hunches. And, you know, that I think there's something very deep to hunches. And so uh, I went to this acting school. And what can you teach a kid at age three? Really, the school that they found was a gimmick. They just wanted to be a daycare that made sure you provided your kids enough money for the vending machines and, uh, but... <laughs> Hollywood daycare. Yeah. It's an acting school. Exactly, that's exactly It's kind of like calling preschool school, yeah, actually. Exactly. <laughs> and then a, um, an agent came along, though, um, talent scouting for kids. And that agent would go on to become the most successful child agent pretty much of all time, and that was Iris Burton. She handled me, Henry, uh, Henry Thomas from E.T., she had Kirk Cameron, she had Fred Savage, she had... Uh, the Olsen twins in the beginning. Um, she had everyone, Kirsten Dunst. I mean, you name it. Her roster was just ridiculous by the time she, she wrapped it up. But I was with Iris from age 3 to 12. And from age 3 to 12, I did probably about 50 national commercials and a whole bunch of guest spots on TV shows that we remember from, um, you know, Mr. Belvedere to yes. uh, the Jeffersons. And, all uh, the best television. Yeah, right, all the best television. <laughs> and uh, that's actually my favorite child star growing up was Bryce Beckham, who played Wesley. It's a very little known name, but uh, I just loved his timing. I would just stare at the TV screen, just hoping I could be as funny as him one day. After about 50 national commercials and, um, and all those guest spots, um, I landed the show that people know me from best when I was age 12 and did that from 12 to 21. What's your first memory of like getting onto a set? I shot a, um, I mean, it's like you're not allowed to mention him. I shot a Jell-O Pudding Pop commercial with Mr. Cosby. I know it's so tragic. It's tragic, but... Um, America's dad is but, not but, anymore. But, but for me, that was, um, that was quite the memory that day. You know, was he nice? He stopped, of course. He was very, very nice. Um, you know, he knew how to handle children. He, was, he, was, he handled children like someone walking dogs. <laughs> he just was like, come on, this is the route. <laughs> And then I also did, this one's probably even bigger, I was in a Lionel Richie Pepsi commercial, 
that speaks to the volume of budget that you were just. Oh, mentioned. that would be like yeah, that a was, Michael Bay right. movie, it was, basically. Yeah, it was huge. It was there were hundreds of people on a back lot, and then um, and I was a minor, so they had to shoot me out early, and so I almost didn't meet Lionel. And then literally, as they wrapped me, I was in the little trailer, you know, honey wagon back then. Trained, and yeah. they said, uh, "Mr. Ritchie has just arrived, and if you'd like to meet him." And, my mom's like practically snatching me out of my underwear to go <laughs> meet Lionel Richie, and um, that's awesome too because I've I've run into him many times since. I mean, matter of fact, I even saw him at Chilton Tavern in uh, in London not too long ago, and um, he was surrounded by bodyguards and in a corner. And um, when I approached him, you know, a giant bodyguard kind right, of steps right. the wall. He, he didn't know who I was, and it, it, it happens. It happens. Not everybody's going to recognize your face. And I said, just. Tell him it's the kid he did a Pepsi commercial with years ago. That made me look over it. Um, I love the serendipity of that. That is just absolutely crazy. I feel like we're just we're we're souls that just for some reason are tracking around each other. Um, some of the people that you run into. One of my favorite commercials also. I did a Ford commercial with a famous director that I didn't know how famous he was going to become. And I kept kicking his ass in horse because on set because he traveled with his own basketball hoop wherever he shoots, and his <laughs> and so, that's, that's so the a... crew was loving it, right? Because nobody, I guess, now that I'm an adult, I get it. Nobody's allowed to beat him on his own court. Uh, but his name was Joe Pitka, and uh, oh yeah, well, that's, he's one of the biggest at the. I mean, yeah. into the '90s and 2000s. Right. So I'm, you know, this yeah. is this is the gray ghost. Joe Pitka has long gray Scooby Doo hair, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is the great ghost in the 80s in his prime. And uh, we're just a bunch of little brat kids on the set. And I mean, I was drawing a basketball like a moth to a flame. So I'm like any second in between school or trying to sneak off to Crafty. I'm just trying to put up hoops. And finally he caught me out there. And like, all right, let's see what you got. And I was waxing his ass. <laughs> You're a working kid. Yeah, very much so. What was the weirdest part about that? Because that's one of the things that's weird about being an actor. It's yeah. like one of the few areas where we actually allow you to work legally as a kid. You know, it's, I, a credit to my parents. They made a lot of mistakes, but they did so much more right. But uh, my mom never told me how much money I ever made on any of those commercials. The understanding was that it was always to raise money to go to college. So that was her, her interest in taking me on the auditions once I booked that agent yeah. in preschool was, oh, wait a minute, this check came. Michael, if he does this between now and high school, he'll have enough money to go to college. You know, a credit to my mom for not telling me about that money side. Now, a credit to my dad <laughs> for keeping me interested because my dad realized that I was falling out of love with acting at about hmm. age 12 because I got braces on my teeth, I'm five foot one, nothing. I love basketball. I'm tired of getting pulled out of practice to go on auditions that I'm not booking. And back right. then, you know, I always like to point this out to people because I celebrate progress. And I wish more people would celebrate progress instead of celebrating them themselves for whatever they're doing at a particular moment in time. Back yeah. then, casting for black kids was very, very different. Um, they were generally casting the bully. They were casting the street kid who was stealing something and got caught. They were, they were very stereotypical roles that a black kid would fall into unless you were one of the two great diminutives, and that was uh, Gary Coleman and Emmanuel Lewis. I wasn't, I didn't have a very street look about me, and so I wasn't booking any of that stuff anymore. And so I was like, I don't want to act anymore. My mom's growing frustrated because she's like, Michael, he can still make some money. And my mom doesn't understand what's about to happen also. I'm about right. to go into an age where Hollywood prefers cast an 18-year-old to look like a 15-year-old, to look like a 16-year-old. And that actually rocks a lot of young performers' confidence levels. Uh, if they don't yeah. have a mentor to let them know, you're not going to book jobs now going into your teens, not because you're not good enough or deserving, but because there's an economic game that's being played on top of your head by all-knowing adults. And so you're better off actually retreating onto your skills, school theater programs, theater camps, et cetera, et cetera, and then waiting to represent yourself to the world when you're 18. So it was weird, and that's why I believe in destiny so much. I was hellbound and determined to quit. I'm done with this crap. I'm five foot one right. and I have braces on my teeth. 
And my dad said, Gail, he doesn't see what's in it for him. Hmm. And so my mom, who's such a control freak, just completely balked at his next suggestion. She said, tell him he can get one of whatever he wants. And she's like, Michael, <laughs> this is reckless parenting. Yeah, you're creating what, a terrible cycle what here. What are you talking about? He can get one of whatever he wants. He only gets things for his birthday and good grades and Christmas, and these are the rules, and his allowance. And what do you mean he can just buy whatever he wants? And he said, Gail, think about it. With the residuals he's going to make on any job, it's going to be several thousands of dollars and, 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 and more than that that comes in because the residual structure and stuff was actually way better back then. Yeah. And this is the money that keeps get, that coming, keeps coming in after, if you do book a yeah. national commercial. Yeah. You're on a Cheerios ad, you're getting checks from General Mills for a long time. Thank you for explaining that to people. Exactly, right? Yeah. So those things are keep trickling in, trickling in, but they're trickling in for somebody who's 10, who's nine, <laughs> 400 bucks, yeah. 500 bucks, 300 bucks, whatever, and it just keeps going to a trust. So if you tell a kid back then, you can get one of whatever you want. That means I'm going to Toys R Us, <laughs> I'm going to Fedco, I'm going to Circuit City, and I'm reaching behind some plexiglass uh, shelf or whatever oh, yeah. that uh, somebody has to unlock and give me something that probably cost at the time $198. Yeah. <laughs> The, un, the, the, right? the in unachievable. My mind, in my mind, I'm like, I've done it. I've arrived. I've arrived. So when he told me I could get one of whatever I wanted, when that audition came up for that particular show, they called for me to play a nerd, and I'm wearing braces on my mouth, and I just, I locked in. I was like, I got to get this job so I can get a new Sega Genesis. Okay, so that's what I was, I was going to ask. <laughs> oh, my God. I was like, I got What is it? it. <laughs> the Sega Genesis, I got to do it. Okay, so before we get into Family Matters, there's a lot of stuff around parent relationships with child actors that is like, it's, not, it's a notorious relationship for like the average person. People mm -hmm. hear this and they tend to think it's all a disaster. Like how was, how was your relationship with your parents as you're working? I actually did a podcast of my own that I so thrilled that I did because it was therapeutic practically. I did it during uh, the worst of pandemic and um, it was called Ever After. And I spoke to other child actors who I know have um, successfully transitioned into adulthood. I think Maya Bialik did it for me. Love her. Raven Simone did it for me. One of my favorite ones actually was a buddy of mine, Matt Shackman, who is a huge director. Game of Thrones. Um, now remind um, me, what did, what did he? What was his sort of? So again, that was I wanted. I told him even when I did, I said I don't want everybody to be famous. I said successfully transitioned. Okay. Matt used to be a kid on a sitcom called uh, Just the Ten of Us. Oh yeah, of course. And, yep. he, was, and he was just one of the kids. Yeah, he and didn't have like a leading role or anything was, like that. Exactly, and, um, but his parents wisely pulled him out of the business a little bit more and he went more technical and, and theater, big, big theater dude. And subsequently he picked up a mentor in Edward Zwick. Now that, remind me who that is. I mean, he directed The Last Samurai. Okay. All right. So he was able to experience what is probably the most important aspect of um, what it is to have a showbiz career, and that is who's vouching for you, who is championing your cause, um, who is saying this guy's the next, who is tapping you for greatness. That didn't happen for me. I walked in on something and stole some. <laughs> 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 yeah, so you mugged a show, so basically. As, much, yeah. as much as I was not booking the job of the kid who stole something and got caught, <laughs> stereotypically, I did walk up to a working situation and steal <laughs> <laughs> and, and And I, look, I say that, I say that humbly because it's funny to me at this point, now that I understand how a star is made, how a director is born, how you know someone comes into unquestioned creative autonomy. <laughs> yeah. um, and I laugh at it because I literally just stepped in it like it was poo. And I mean, just incredible creative autonomy that ironically, I'm still actually chasing to get more of today at this point in my life. I had more creative autonomy, just pure instinctual power to be like, let's do that, let's do that throughout my uh, my pubescent years than I did than I do now. So you, you you take on this role, Steve Urkel. Yeah. It's 
it's initially like, was it just gonna be one episode? What yeah, was the- Yeah, the book. That's a weird role to take on in middle school. So it's like, yeah. I'm gonna be a TV nerd and yeah. I'm in the time where everybody feels like their, their skin itches, right. you know, and they don't know what their identity is and it's just a mess. It's like the worst. You know, I was the only black kid in my entire school in San Marino. Um, that was an issue that I was dealing with. It was also an age where I discovered we weren't rich. And we weren't poor, but now I was definitively, my mom had gotten me into this school district to go to school with rich kids. And it really is amazing though how you can start to, you really can't manifest. Well, let me just say, yeah. it's, it's a testament to your parents that it wasn't until middle school that you felt like you oh, yeah. went without, you know? Oh, yeah. I didn't even, they had fooled me. Matter of fact, my parents, I can share this now, this is cool, but my parents had fooled me into thinking that we had ample of everything. I was seven years old and that was the best Christmas ever because my parents pretended they didn't get me anything. And so I saw nothing coming under the tree. And so my dad came in and I was crying in my bunk bed and my dad came in and gave me a wrapped up can of freaking uh, tennis balls. <laughs> And I'm like, you know, really, you, should, you just open that. Like, yeah, thanks, bro. <laughs> right? It's like, so and, like that's a real head right? fake right, right there. Right. All right. So I get it, my mom, we're getting the giggles <laughs> off at my, my seven year old expense. And then he, uh, and then he comes back probably like about five minutes later and gets me out of my bunk bed after midnight. And he goes, I think Santa did bring a little bit more than that, though. You might want to go check. That was my dad. It was that, he was that corny guy that liked to play out every little beat of, uh, of the story of the prank. And I get up and there's more toys under this tree than I just, it was, it was my list times 10. I had piano synthesizers. I had Mr. T dolls. I had, yes. I had a new tennis racket. I had a, this robot that I wanted called Omnibot. You can look it up. It was the biggest deal. It was $299 and it was like at the top shelf at, 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 at Toys R Us. And I, I, yeah. it was it was just nonstop rapping. I'm an only child too, so I have no competition. <laughs> this is just me going at it with paper. And my parents had filed for bankruptcy that year. Oh man, that's tough. So this is a, this is this moment for them where they're like, you know what, we're gonna let this be special. That's parenting. What happened next with with your family? We were fine. We were fine. But um, what an amazing testament to parenting. I just feel like that's what real parents, if they're strong enough, do. You don't let your kids know, you know, stuff that's going on that's adult oriented. And so they protected my innocence in an amazing way that it would take five more years before I figured out we didn't have <laughs> so now we can laugh again, all right? I don't want to get, get memed up for tears because I just, I have, a, I have a very special place in my heart for understanding the sacrifices that real parents will make to protect the psyche of the child that they're raising. A moment like that and everything in between is what helped make me me. You know, this is one of these things that Again, I, I think you have a unique perspective from your professional experience on, which is this world of social media does two, two things with our kids that we didn't have growing up. Um, well, you did though, in a, in a very peculiar way. It, everybody can now be putting themselves out there for millions of people to see. You had that, yeah. but you had that in a time when that was really, really rare, and now any kid can have that. Well, yeah, it's not only did I have that at a time when it was rare, I had it in a time when it was unique and it was celebrated. And also fame was not disconnected with excellence. That's a really good point. That's a Drake quote, so I'm not taking that. Yeah, <laughs> right. No, but you had, to, you had to pass through a bunch of layers uh, to prove you had right. skill and then you had to deliver a performance right. so in order to be back, getting the eyeballs. Back in the 80s and the 90s, it was just, it was understood I don't even think nepotism was highlighted as much back then. It was still assumed that you would be great at something if you wanted to be famous or you, were, or you ended up famous. 
being famous for no reason or just famous because you were best friends with somebody else or famous because of a meme or a scandal or whatever. There's a whole category of, of ways you can become famous now that are not necessarily beneficial to your, your long-term existence or your psyche. But back then, if you became famous, you existed in a bubble of admiration because you had done something great. Well, and this is the thing, you say memes, you know, you are, you, you, your performance is, will live on forever. It's like, you are gifts, you are memes in, in your character, in the character you played as, as Steve Urkel. There's something super special about that. It's like, uh, so talk about your relationship with that, <clears throat> because that's the other thing that our kids are experiencing now yeah. is you put yourself out there and it's not you, it's a version. It's like this avatar of you. Yeah, no. You, they, we, and you have that as an actor and as an actor that has an iconic character. How has your relationship with this other you evolved over time, especially after you left the show? Ooh. One, there's a strain of cannabis that makes me relevant with that legacy in a whole cooler way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I made my peace with it, brother. If you only knew. <laughs> when my daughter got here, um, it changed my perspective, period, on what my purpose is on this planet. It became less about self. It became more about providing. It became more about providing a good example. It's amazing how quickly I turned into my father the second she got here. And, hmm. uh, you know, I wish I had an unblemished um, IMDb, you know, that just hops from one Marvel project or whatever to the next and only A-list directors. But that wasn't my journey. You know, I have certain jobs on my IMDb, man, that um, I think one in particular Mega Shark versus Crocosaurus. So I, I, uh, I'm so damn proud of that freaking job, man. I remember <laughs> the director, Chris Ray. Um, it's all different now, so it's yeah. like unpack it. Don't put up, you know, peel the banana away. Screw the pretense and the, you know. Sci-fi yeah. originals have a very special place in my heart oh, as, a, as a nerd. <laughs> so tell me about working on that project. Um, that um, project, <laughs> I was dealing. Mega Shark versus. Uh, Crocosaurus, right? Megatron versus Crocosaurus. I'm so <laughs> I'm so proud of that of that of that movie. I Remind me, was this after Sharknado or before Sharknado? We were pre-Sharknado. So, so I was I was part of I was part of the reason that the Sharknado thing started because yeah. the ratings were so crazy <laughs> off of this shit that they were just like you know it, more sharks, just just anything with a shark, right? I was not that creative of a town sometimes. Yeah. A project for me now means it tells a story about a moment in my life. I don't look at a movie poster or a project necessarily as a moment where I got to be the biggest star. It's just, you know, it's just, it's a moment in my life. And at that time, I was going through co-parenting hell. Um, I was up the wazoo in lawyer's fees, which is a whole nother conversation for another podcast. But when in California, if you're the top earner, our system makes you pay for the other person's attorney's fees. Oh man. On top of your own. It's a little known fact about California family court that basically gives all the leverage to the parent that's not earning a dime. Well, and it also is this pain dial that is very easy for you to keep cranking because you can just keep it going just to make sure you've got and that's exactly what was what was happening to me and it's not an it's not a subject matter that you get much empathy on and i'm proud to have survived it and moved on from it i really am but at that particular time i was in court and so i didn't even know if i was going to be able to take the project when i read the script for mega sharp versus crocosaurus i remember calling my manager and i was like you really want me to do this <laughs> And um, I just remember, and he was like, oh, Jalil, people need to see you in uniform. <laughs> and it was, I was just, I'll never forget that response. So I, I was like, wow, this, that's, that's really basic. <laughs> right? Right? More people need to see me in uniform. So yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, play in, uh, I play a Navy guy, and, um, and I remember I had to be at court. And... Chris Ray was the director was also going through a, a child custody matter. But 
his child was in Florida. So he had already accepted the fact that my child is gone and oh. I will see her when I see her. And so it was, I just feel like it was surreal that God had given me this director who was going through the same thing, except he was actually a bit more defeated in custody than I was at the time. And he had all the empathy in the world for my situation and was just like, hey man, go to that court date and just get here when you get here. And I'm showing up. Now, mind you, when you're leaving court too, you're not in the best of freaking moods. All you no. really want to do is drink or, you know, rail against the world or whatever and be alone or whatever. <laughs> And, uh, and that's, this is coming from a guy who doesn't even historically drink. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't have my first sip of liquor until I was 24 in Greece. Um, and, um, but I get to work, and we shot 19 pages in one day. Which is a monstrous amount. Okay, so that is, for anybody who's yeah. a film buff out there, that's yeah. like... That's, that's, that's crazy. That's Ed Wood shit. Yeah. That, that's... Yeah. that's yeah. Like, I would be effing up my lines on this helicopter with this <laughs> Let's green keep going. That was great. Back, and he's just leaning off to the side like... <laughs> Why are we whispering? <laughs> are we still filming while you're talking to me? me? Why are you talking? <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> the editor will work around that, right? So that because of everything, we got that twelve shoot there, days for a feature. Keep right? keep going. So keep because going. of everything that was going on at the time. When that movie hit really big for sci-fi and it got great ratings, that job, the job where everybody needs to see me in uniform, right, <laughs> ended up being the reason why sci-fi hired me to host another job that is my second favorite job I've ever had, and that was where I was the host of Total Blackout. And that was a game show yeah. where we put people in pitch black darkness for time challenges, and it was a <laughs> hoot. That show should have run forever. But once again, <laughs> ratings, Twitter, lit Twitter up. Like, this is the early days of Twitter, too. Like, what is going on here? They have people smelling to advance to the next round. This is wild. Right, right. And uh, the show crushed it. I got to be the host. It was so fun. I would drop my daughter in the elimination pits. It was great. But that's just, a, that's a, that's just an example, though, of what it is to be a father and take a job that you don't want to take, but your heart is telling you, you need to take it, you should take it, you're listening to the right people, it, the check cleared, you made a great relationship with this director, you had uh, some real moments there, and boom, it led to something else that you really did love. So how did, your, how did you becoming a dad um, rewire your brain? How did, it re, how did it restructure? Give me like a very concrete, the first just, moment where you were like, I'm now different. Um, so I ended up a single dad pretty early on and, uh, probably like within 10 or 11 months of my daughter being born. And at the time I still had like an Aston Martin and a Range Rover. And yeah, I was, I was, I was still me, yeah. <laughs> the, the me I thought I was going to be. <laughs> and I remember my boy called me out to a nightclub and I had a night nanny. So the night nanny could watch my daughter times and he was like man you got to get out here tonight dog come on you can't no you got to get out here tonight I said, man, come on man i ain't got time for that right now he was like man i'm telling you man this is you don't want to miss this you know you always had that guy that was like you tonight <laughs> tonight right not it's tomorrow, all gonna change not, not today, yeah, tonight. It's, tonight. <laughs> it's, it's gonna happen tonight and uh so i hop in i hop into aston and I had a four-door Aspen at the time, and I swoop up, and it's like the club is spilling out. So we go into some after-party stuff. And it's probably about four women and that came up to my car. And, I mean, they were bad. They were bad. So I was like, I, I, as soon as I swooped up, I hit the U-turn. And this is before Uber. So we're trying to figure out rides. Yeah. You know, going to the next spot. And I intentionally did not want to go in the club. I'm like, we gonna, I'll do the after party with you. Swoop, swoop, cool. Four women come over. It's like, yeah, all right, what's the next move? Hey, girls, what's up, what's up, what's up? They see the car, the car's nice. The car's doing its thing, right? And it's like, so now we're trying to figure out rides, and the girls are like, shoot, we, we hopping in this. The girl, <laughs> one of the girls tries to open my back door, and I'm like, oh, oh, it all happened so fast. The baby seat was in the back of the Aston. So the one girl goes around and she sits next to the baby seat and the other one gets in the front car. Front, and it just, 
Whatever it was supposed to happen that night, it didn't go down. <laughs> I just got peppered with question after question about my daughter and my relationship with my daughter's mom and blah, blah, blah. And it was just missed. And I'm just like, okay, check, please, because I still got to pay the bill. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and, and it, was, it was just a moment for me where I realized I was like, I actually want my baby seat in the car more than I want to go out for this night anymore. I'm not taking that damn baby seat out. It's a pain in the ass to put in. It's going to stay in. And this is my life now. And so that was, that was a real seminal moment for me um, as, as a father. And I just think cinematically it plays out that way. It's kind of funny. That is a transition to being an adult, right? <laughs> so talk about that. Talk about how do you think about what it means to become an adult? And I know, oh, I know you've- I, <laughs> It sucks. Well, I know you've talked about this in other places about, about it being harder for you. And, and your work as a child yeah. actor, yeah. maybe getting in the way of grappling. Okay, so let me add some context to that, though. Yeah. It's not the characters that I play that have ever held me back. I don't want anybody to think that. It's not fair to the work that I did. And I'm so happy to put that into a proper context for people so they go, oh, okay. When you're young, you don't know who to work for. And in show business, you are who you work for. Yeah, so that's definitely true. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think that's true everywhere. And you're, it's actually true everywhere. Yeah, your it's bosses. Just, I had great bosses. And so I, you I, know where I'm going with it. So I can see it. It makes a huge. They are. They they plot your course. They They're, plot your course. Yeah. Who you worked for. If you actually go back and look at TGIF and all of the people who are on TGIF, I've made out pretty good. <laughs> this is true, okay? I've made out pretty good. That's why I was like, I can't let, what's it like being a child star? I was like, hey man, I was a, I was a hamburger above the chuck <laughs> the, beneath yeah, me. You were an Angus burger. And, yeah, and I, was, and I was only a hamburger above them, but I was above them. And, uh, and the Olsen twins, holy smokes, they were, <laughs> they were something else, yeah, right? Yeah. They got out. And so I think that's the thing that hurts you more when you're a young performer, is you don't know who to work for. Um, I'll be very candid. I even said, that's one of the reasons why I didn't want to do um, a reboot. Would you be the dad this time around? Or and that's exactly what it was. Yeah. It was a very cliche pitch. Yeah, it seems. I, I, almost, I was almost insulted by the pitch because I was like. Did you put more than 10 minutes of thought in Yeah, this? I'm like, <laughs> I'm looking at that pitch here on Twitter. So who owns the intellectual rights to that? Because I'm looking at that pitch right now on Twitter. Several times over. Family matters, but yeah. now Urkel's yeah. the dad. Yeah, exactly. And, okay. right. yeah. and I had a much better idea for a show. I had something that I felt was like would really connect with this generation on a, on a you know, in, in its storytelling and its cinema. And, you know, they just looked at me like, no, just put on the glasses and suspenders and be the dad. That's what we're buying. Like, what? And so one of the reasons why I said no, though, is because I said um, no, because what happens is the kids that we hire to do the new one, they're not going to work anymore. So I'm going to get on their futures knowingly hmm. because that's what's happened to the children in Fuller House. And I predicted it. They don't work. So they're not cool enough by executive standards to be in your euphorias and stranger things and and all of this really cool cinematic stuff, the same casting people and executives who hired them to be in Fuller House will now look at them and say, sorry, you can't, can't run with the big dogs. And you don't know that as a kid. That because yeah, it's I'm, just your break. Yeah, it's like you're going to be on TV in yeah, front of millions exactly. of people. So you, because I'm working with this guy now, I can't work with this famous director's daughter or this famous producer's uh, nephew. I'm not pedigree enough now to, yeah, you did that to yourself when you star in a Baywatch or you star in certain properties that are thought to be um, earners, but not, but they lack snob appeal. And so that's really, I didn't want to do that to another generation. I just wouldn't have felt good about that in my heart at all. If I, if when I work with kids, my joy in working with kids is like knowing that 
10, 20 years from now, you can say, hey man, I got to work with Jaleel White and because I did, I got this other opportunity and now that guy's like at the Oscars. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, you know, not, not every story ends up like uh, Kwan, who won for everything, best Oscar, I mean, man, best, uh, best actor. Not every story ends up like that, where the truth of the matter was, there was no plan for him. I promise you, Steven yeah. Spielberg needed an Asian kid to be in this movie, and there was no plan for him. Now, the good news is he did work for somebody amazing, but at that time, times were different. Asian representation was nil. So yeah. his next project- It was long ducked on the exact, or it, some bingo, other nonsense. Bingo, there you go, exactly. <laughs> so his next project, nobody was thinking about it. Yeah. And that's why there's this incredible gap between that performance and his Oscar win now. Now in this day and age, if there were an Asian kid that had his impact as, as short round in, in Indiana Jones, that kid would get a zillion followers and he'd have a whole bunch of executives saying, this is the best diversity representation we could ever have. Let's run with this. What's he gonna star in next? Because this day and age offers that. But that day and age did not offer that. And it's not too long ago. So I just want people to know that during that time, because social media had not been born yet, um, and I was a minor, I didn't know who I was working for and under what terms. Um, even back then, we had a lot more exclusivity stuff in our contracts, so they didn't want you working for a competitor. You know, um, now that's that's loosened up a lot. Like you can't yeah. you can't <laughs> tell me because I'm on ABC now I can't do something for Netflix. Let's let's shift it to the personal though. An underlying theme of this show is I feel like one of the things we do as dads is we help our our kids to grow up. Mm -hmm. we, we try to, I think that's one of our jobs is like, how do we set them up to be like a functional adult? Like yeah. we are going to die. They are going to continue God willing. Yeah. And are they going to be able to navigate this crazy world yeah. in a way that keeps them sane, keeps them, ha keeps them happy as best as we can. I loved my instincts though, when I became a dad, because stuff started just coming to me to teach my daughter. That was part my mom, part my dad, part myself. And it was just coming through instinct. I hadn't read in any books or anything like that. Actually, there's two books that are my favorite dad books. Um, there's one called The Baby Manual and there's one called The Toddler Manual. And they're both written as car manuals for babies. That's great. They're, 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 <laughs> these two books are brilliant. I, I literally send these books. Do they have diagrams? Yeah, they have diagrams. <laughs> I literally send these books to expectant fathers. And I'm like, dude, get this, trust me. I know the women read that big thick one. You don't have to touch that. You will be just <laughs> as smart as her with these manuals. Yeah. It is awesome. No, none of this what to expect yeah. when you're expecting. Yeah, no, yeah, none of that crap, none of that crap. It's, <laughs> it's like the baby cries for four functions. Go through the checks, <laughs> check that. It was like, and it's like the baby really does cry for four, four reasons. Um, Dashboard lights. Yeah, that, that one, those two books helped me out a ton. But then it would just be instinctual stuff with my daughter like, one, when we would walk through parking lots um, at age two, three, we would just play this game where um, she would, who would recognize brake lights first. And uh, brake lights means a car's backing up. Right. And so I was always trying to train her to be aware when she wasn't with me because I was in a co-parenting situation. Brake lights and driveway, you know, even when we were walking even we were just walking on a sidewalk yes. and going through a driveway, it'd be like, she would, she would stop, she'd be like, driveway! And it was just like a little game that we would play or whatever, just do it over there. And who said it first? And it was like, brake lights! And you know, she did it every now and then, it'd be like, you saw those brake lights, we're getting ice cream right now. And she's like, yes! Right? And I, it was just <laughs> I gotta say, that is a great tip. Gamify <laughs> oh, yeah. brake lights and driveways. Yeah. Because it is, this is one of these little things that when you're not, when you don't have kids, you don't think about, but yeah. you're walking down you're walking down a sidewalk, and that's, that's scary. Oh, dude, little <laughs> And you're thinking, like, if they're out with their friends, if I want to be a good parent that lets my kid be out with my, their, their friends when they're seven, eight, nine years old. Dude, which... little suburban kids, and even their suburban moms, who are probably worse, just wander throughout parking lots and streets like everybody's supposed to stop for them. I went to freaking um, Thailand and Vietnam, and I'm seeing parents on mopeds and 
the parents are wearing helmets and the kids are not. The kids are like on the shoulders and they're riding. I was like, this is some gangster parenting going on out yeah, here. Yeah. And we can't even get our kids to just look both ways before they cross the streets or not get hit out of it by a car that's backing up. So that was one of the early games I started playing with her to make her very aware of her environment. And she took to it very quickly. Um, another thing I would do that just came instinctually, uh, I never let my daughter answer me what. Um, I have a very hmm. strong theory behind that. Yeah, um, elaborate yeah. on that. Uh, yeah, so, you know, you call your child, and you're like, smile, and it's like, what? And, yes, got it. Yes, daddy, yes, all right. What? There's a, there's a slight tinge of I'm annoyed in that. True. You're bothering me. I'm doing something. And if you allow that to continue, it's eventually going to become under her breath, what the... And eventually it's going to become what the... And so it's just a, it's a simple word of response. I mean, you wouldn't do it in the military. You wouldn't do it in a, in a classroom with a professor. They call your name. What? You wouldn't. No, it's so rude. why? It's rude. So why, as a parent, would you allow your child from the earliest age to respond to you? What? And I promise you that's going to land on some parents. They're like, oh, crap. Like, that's how my kid answers me. Now, what happens then is once, once that's established at such a young age... Kids actually want boundaries as early as like 16 months, like 12 months. And, and this is just instinctual stuff. I'm sure it's probably written in books far no, better. No, you're right about Far, that. far better. I remember I, was, I went to feed my daughter in her high chair. And in my mind, I was just going to start shoveling like she was Popeye. You know, I did, it was this, I've got a bowl here, I've got a spoon. You're going to open your mouth and this is how we're going to do this. And I'm going to get back to doing something else I want to do. And I, I got the, the plate of, the, the bowl of food and she was like... Oh, crap. Yeah, the pulling the, pu yeah, trying to push yeah, it into the mouth. making all these family like, stuff. Like, oh, and then I look at my nanny who's in the kitchen, and she just kind of like snickers, like, I made the food, but good luck getting it in there, right? And then I remember my daughter um, started crying, and I could hear her. I just had an, I was like, that's a fake cry. And I just said it as clear as that. I was like, that's a fake cry. And she looked up to me, looked with demonic eyes. I'm like, it's not a fake cry. And she said every word just like that, like she was a 35 year old woman. <laughs> it's not a fake cry. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you're crazy. Right? And it was like, it just realized that even though she was a baby, there was this older soul inside of her that was governing her moves, though. And she was very self aware of manipulating me. And I picked that up at like, like I said, 14, 15 months, 16 months, something around. It had to have been around too. And those were the type of moments that I had that let me know I was dealing with a child that was capable of a lot more than what we give them. I'll be honest with you. I had a moment in court where my daughter was asked by a child evaluator about her parents separately. And then it came back to the judge, and the judge announced in court, well, the father does believe in corporal punishment. And I remember I stared that down right to the back of his skull, like, yes, and what? Because I know what I'm providing for my daughter. So how dare you, anybody in this court, want to insinuate that she could be abused? But she had hidden under a bed like a few days before court, and I heard her. Uh, giving her nanny a hard time. And I jumped up and I left my office and I ran into her bedroom. And I just instinctively did what my mom would have done at that time. And I just grabbed one leg out of that bed and just pulled it right out. And the leg, just, the arm just kept coming around and it was just like, bow, right on the butt. She did a little wiggle <laughs> walk to the bathroom, right? And so I didn't consider at the time that four days later I would be in court. Yeah, not, not the it, most it, it, strategic thing. The timing spank. was terrible. But one of the things that I did, I'm, again, another moment I'm really grateful for, just parenting instincts. She did something else that she shouldn't have done like a few days later. And she's probably about four going on five at this point. And I remember I said, Smile, why did you do that? And she just kind of shrugged. And then I said, um, do you know what you should have done? And she's like, oh, yeah, I should have done so and so and so and so. And you know that would have made me happier and that was the safer thing to do. It was like, mm-hmm. So again, why did you do it? 
Mm. So you so you told me what you did, you told me what you should have done, and then when we got to the why of it, you just gave me a little little mischievous shrug. And I remember the conversation she and I had at like four years old. And I told I told her I spoke to her like she was. I would encourage all parents speak to your kids like they're adults. And I told her I said, "Somebody, you're too smart for me to be hitting you." And I got my last ass whooping when I was 12. I was on Family Matters, still getting beat. That's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I've made peace with that with my parents, like I said. So, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. I was like, and I, in that moment, I was, I was like, Smile, you're too smart for me to be putting my hands on you. And, and when I say beat, I mean hit the bottom. Yeah. I've never hit my daughter any place other than her bottom. I'm proud yeah. of myself for realizing that if, if you're blessed to have a child that's smart enough that it's on the parent to recognize when that form of punishment needs to stop. And so I'm re that's a moment I'm really proud of that I caught myself at when my daughter being age four, because my mom didn't catch herself until my dad had to pull her aside <laughs> at 12 and 13. You know, it was like, Gail, you can't be beaten on him like this. There's things with my the parents record. I've made peace with but you, I, I do want people to respect these were cultural norms. Like I've made peace with my parents over, over this stuff. But more importantly, I tell this story to say, I'm so proud that I was able to grow enough as a person that it never got to that point with me and my daughter. And her behavior is exemplary. And it's strictly because I caught it at age four or five, where I was like, you're too smart. Yeah. You know what you did. I mean, Let's discuss it. I've, uh, you know, so I have one son, he's 18. There's been a couple times, I'll admit, where when he was little, he got a spank. Yeah. And the times that it happened, and maybe this was bad parenting, uh, but uh, he, he was putting himself in jeopardy and he was not at the age of reason. He was, he was three or four years old, right around the time, the last time you spanked your daughter. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not gonna reason with him about this thing where he could injure himself if I'm not around. Pain has a purpose. <laughs> Pain... I, listen, boys are different too. Boys yeah. are different. Boys sometimes just need a little more... Um, physicality. Yeah, a little more physicality you know, and, and, a, and, and a more clear understanding of boundaries, whereas girls test the, those boundaries differently and they love testing them psychologically. So once I realized that my daughter was psychologically reasonable, Ah, it was just like a breath of fresh air. And then I would see other kids and I would, you know, like when you're in your 20s and you're running around in that Aston with the freaking baby seat in the back, you don't even notice parks. You don't notice their purpose. You don't notice how many of them there are in the city. You don't notice how populated they are with women and children and dads and co-parenting and people meeting for drop-offs and exchanges. And you, know, you don't see any of that in that part of our, our city infrastructure. Um, and all of a sudden, you get introduced to the park, right? So I loved taking my daughter to the park. I would frequently meet my nanny at the park after schools and stuff like that. And my daughter would be playing. And invariably, the park is where you see the worst parenting. Oh, on ev across the entire across spectrum. Across the spectrum, you're like, oh, well, you, you're, you're seeing moms that are just engrossed in their phone. The kid is over here vomiting on, on other equipment that other kids are using. And <laughs> nobody can really touch that kid because it's not our kid. But we see the mom over here on the phone and girl, let me tell you. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> this is what's taking place over here. Although I might take that behavior over the parent who's hovering over the kid to make sure they, they you know, never get to feel anything happen. Uh, I'm not gonna take it, but <laughs> both are bad, <laughs> both are bad. But my daughter, when she would see kids either just, you know, throwing sand at somebody else or just doing something that was just like, hey, that's out of pocket behavior. And we're talking like age three and four now too, three oh, yeah. and four. Her instinct, they're little animals. They're little freaking animals, man. And like her instinct was to just look at it, observe it, and then find me. And when I saw that that was her instinct, I was like, dude, this little girl's so smart. Because I would be seeing the same thing. So what I would do is, was the second I clocked it, now I'm looking at her. And then I'm always gonna be at that age faster than her. And so she looks at me and she sees me looking at her. 
We don't even have to speak. Don't try it. You know better. <laughs> don't ever try that. That kid's a fool. And we would have those, mo I mean, I had countless moments like that with my daughter at parks with her observing another dynamic between other kids or a kid and their parent and then looking at me and I'm already looking at her. And I just, I, I love that moment so much because in order to have that moment, you have to be one, present. So put your phone away. Mm -hmm. When you go yeah. to these parks with your kid, let that be an hour to observe your kid. Either participate when they want to, because they'll invite you, you know, look what I've done, look what I can do. You know, they love look what I can do. You know, then they can do three monkey bars across, right? Yeah, that's, uh, a, that's a good, right? That's a good experience. Right, that's it. And yeah. then finally they can make it all the way across, right? You're taking me back now, man. I was going through so much, but I just still had my mom's instinct to just be present. And I'm a little more observant than my mom. My mom's really observant, but I'm just, I'm on another level observant than her. So I'm seeing things almost at a matrix level in this park of just social dynamics and even with my daughter. And it, it just, it helped us grow so much without me having to say a word. All I had to do was just be present and observe. And so I really encourage any father to do that. There's a funny yeah, thing yeah. I've, um about that, what you're describing, which is, in a way, that's like the perfect balance because you weren't hovering, no. but you were there. I feel like one of the things our kids do at that age is they're, they're on like a, a leash, they're on like a rope to us, and they're slowly asking for more rope. Yep. And they just wanna, they don't want you to be holding it tight, but they are glad it's there. Oh, absolutely. My, my daughter used to love picking up leaves when she was a toddler and going up and down steps. I don't know why, those were her things. She finds steps, she go up and down the steps, up and down the steps. If the pitch of the steps got a little too steep, she started reaching for people. Mm -hmm. Hey, I need, I need a hand, I need a hand. Once she figured out the pattern of, of, of the steps, then she started knocking your hand away. <laughs> and I mean, like I said, that 35 year old woman came out again, that old soul, I got this, don't touch me anymore, right? Don't touch me anymore. <laughs> yeah, oh and yeah. I saw that as a part of her personality. Like if she doesn't, if she's not confident in what she needs to know, then she's very insecure. But once she gets that confidence, I got this, I don't need to talk to you about this anymore. What's your advice for the parent who's feeling like a, like that desire to get in there and help help more help more than is helpful. Ooh, man, she went through a a mean girl period. Oh, the worst is yet she's 13? Uh, the worst is yet to come. No, 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 I like my daughter. <laughs> no, 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 I'm serious. I like the way she navigated. That's why I got to give her I always give her props. But the transition from 5th grade to like now 8th grade, especially on the you know, on the younger side of that. Some stuff happened. It got weird in, in some friend groups. Yeah. And I remember one time she came home and I could just tell, I told her, just, just observing her. I was just like, what's wrong? And she's like, no. And I've had to ask her probably about five different times over the course of like an hour. Like, what's wrong? You can tell me. She started crying on my shoulder. She started crying. And I knew in that moment too, not to say anything. Just pat her on the back and hug her. That's it. And I wanted to say something, typical guy. We always want to open our freaking mouths and make it worse. Yeah. <laughs> right? Well, we think, that, we think that every problem is like, right. is basically like some screws that got loose that yeah. we just need to tighten with the right wrench. Yeah, right, exactly. You know? exactly. Right. <laughs> I got a wrench in here right? for this. But this, just tell me what size I, this, it is. This wasn't in the manual. This <laughs> one was just like, I asked her five, four or five times and she's like, and she just started crying on my shoulder. I just pat her on the back and just rubbed her back. And I just put that, I just I said, you're gonna figure it out. I know you, you're smart. Like, I know how smart you are. You're gonna figure it out. And she was just going through some girl stuff, um, you know, with, with friend groups, girls from elementary school, not knowing um, how to transition away from each other and make new friendships without them feeling the pangs of rejection. Um, well, and girls do a lot of weird stuff at this thing. You know. Listen, with what I know about with boys, groups, it's different. Like a boy enters the group and there's a hazing and then they're integrated. Yeah, yeah. If you got two girls playing yeah. and a third comes in, this is on average. It's like a whole different dynamic plays Dude. out. Somebody's getting kicked out of the boat. Three it's girls on a play date, terrible number. Yeah. 
It's got to be two or four. Yeah. Three girls, terrible number. There's always going to be an odd man out. Woo! Well, not always, but Ter it's, terrible it's different stuff. There's no writing partner there. <laughs> but boys are very activity oriented. So we bond over activity. So you play basketball or you play Call of Duty or you play, some yeah. what's up? Let's go. Cool, right? <laughs> you could be a thief. Uh, you steal every day after school. But uh, dude, you're really yeah. good at Call of Duty? When you're done stealing, I will meet you. <laughs> <laughs> when you're done with your larceny, here's my handle, here's my handle. on Xbox Live. <laughs> and that's just the way boys are at that, at that particular age, right? Uh, until the cops show up. And he's like, okay, I, can't, I think there's somebody else that plays Call of Duty. I'm going to go play with that kid. Um, but girls are more emotional in their pairing up. As a matter of fact, my daughter, I watched her volleyball team. I knew they were going to suck because they didn't like each other. Yeah. Okay. And it was yeah. like after the first day of practice, she gets in the car with me and she's like, I'm like, what's wrong? She's like, ah, oh, this girl, that girl. Does. She starts just, just, you know, breaking down the whole dynamic of all the girls, what they can't do, can't do, can't do. I was like, oh. And I had to imagine, I'm like, well, they're probably saying this about her too. So, and then I watched them play and it was just, it was so disjointed. And girls have to like each other first and then go do the activity. Oh, that's interesting. That Bo sounds, that rings true to me. Boy, right? So yeah. it's like, if girls just get around a bunch of girls and they're like, oh, I don't like her, I don't like, I don't like her. Screw the game, the game is already lost. <laughs> the game is, boys be like, oh, I don't know this dude, I don't, I don't catch this guy. But now, if, if you bounce past it to that dude and that kid finishes with some nice layup and he always running the break, and every time you look to your right, and because you're a natural point guard, this kid's taller than everybody, and he's always finishing your bucket and then coming around and giving you a high five, dude. 20 minutes later, y'all best friends. <laughs> That's just the way boys, boys work. It never even gets to the bounce, bounce pass <laughs> and the finish the layup with girls. It was like, I don't like her. I don't like her. That's it. So why didn't you pass me? I was open. Why did you pass? Me? Exactly. Side eye, side eye. Answer. I didn't pass you because I didn't like you. I just didn't like you. It's like so. That's a different function of men and women, right there. That um, I feel very privileged and, and and that I'm aware enough to peep that. So I try to do things even to help her foster better relationships, and that part is tough too because sometimes girls don't want to be the first one to step out, and it's like, well, invite her to this or you know even though she's not un uncharacteristically somebody that you would befriend, just let her know that, you know, if she did want to spend some time with you, you would be open to that. You know, the thing that this whole conversation, all I can think about is the fact that, you know, you're just clearly so connected to your daughter. You have, you have such a great, it sounds like a, such a great relationship with her. And for a lot of dads out there, uh, especially who have separated from, whether it's their spouse or their girlfriend, oh. it's like, what is your advice to the men who have a, a child who are in a position where they can be pushed away um, to stay involved? We're going into deep podcast waters here. You know, uh, I mean, this is one in, you know, one in four American kids yeah. are being raised without their dad yeah. in the home, yeah. in, in their life. Yeah. It's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of kids out there and that means there's a lot of dads out there where that connection has been severed. Basically, a child is pretty much fully formed by the time they're 13, 14 anyway. Um, they still have life lessons, but their character and who they're going to be, it's pretty much fully formed. I agree with that. And I know eighth that. Eighth grade. Yeah, and I eight, that's middle school. That's what, oh, middle school is it, they're, baby. You surrender them to their peers yeah. in high school. Yeah, so that's why I said I was, when you mentioned your own your own son in, in middle school, what it was for him. And I'm like, I'm, I go back to my middle school experience, which was just absolutely wild. And then my daughter's middle school experience is just, it's cupcakes compared to what I went through. And she's, she's graduating middle school this year? Yeah, she's yeah. graduating middle school this so year. She survived. this year. So she survived. So she survived it. She, she survived <laughs> it, exactly. Um, but I did the math and I realized, I was like, do I want a young woman who knows me and my values and what I stand for? Do I want to go through that process with her where she knows this? For 13, 14 years? Or am I gonna take this L and let this kid be stripped away from me and end up growing up wherever? And invariably, because I'm me, she's gonna reach out and want to get to know me at maybe, oh, 13, 14. Hey, she's gonna come down and see you for the summer or whatever. But now I'm meeting a child that has a ton of resentment, 
doesn't know what I stand for. And for 13, 14 years, has been f I've been framed to be a deadbeat. No matter how much money I'm sending, I was like, oh, I don't want that. Because now I'm stuck with a person who's going to have seeds of doubt about who I am for the rest of their adulthood. No matter how good we make it on any given day because I just missed those years. So it was a fight that I was drawn into that I hate, but I knew I had to survive it if I just wanted peace on the back end of my life. So that's an individual thing for men to decide where they stand with an adult child looking them back in the, in the, in the eyes. And I made that decision when she was a toddler because I just knew the way I wanted her to look back at me as a grown woman. So I knew what it would take. You know, everything, unfortunately, in our country, we're the states of America, but we're not very united. Um, is, is everything is state, state to state. Yeah. So you, it's, every state offers different leverage in certain circumstances. And that I would encourage any man to A, know the laws of your state, just the basic ones, you know, like New York is a one parent state. Like they really encourage that the child actually only live with one parent during the formative years. Um, and, and they give tremendous leverage to the female in. I think throughout the country, the, the men, men in these situations are on the, I on will, the bad end of the, the state. I know, but I'm talking about leverage. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just talking about just sheer, yeah. just sheer like what the mm -hmm. court will do. Like, States like Texas and stuff like that, they don't make it a gold rush to have a baby with anybody. On a positive front, I try to tell dudes now, and I didn't put much stock into this, try your best to date women who you would be proud of their effort as a mother. Like, look at their mom. Look at the relationship that they have with their mom. Look at the relationship they have with their dad. I, I dated a lot of broken women, and I didn't realize I was doing it. I don't, that's it. Like I said, there's some things I'll, I'll go on a separate podcast, but I'm like, but I'm like, I date a lot of broken women and, and, and the woman I'm with now, she's so not broken and she understands the ways that she's repaired herself and she's got kick ass mom and dad. And I love watching their dynamic. We'll go on vacations with her parents for a while. And then I know my parents are still together. So she has really good examples of when things break down between us. I know who she's going to reach to for advice. So sometimes the advice comes back also like, well, maybe you should do something different. Go, oh, okay. And now it's my job not to rub it in her face. But guys going through a co-parenting situation, I want any guy to be able to recognize, is he working with somebody who is with a mom who is putting in effort? Like real effort. Like she makes the drives. She packs the lunches. Your child is clean. The hair is done. Your nails are clean the food that's being purchased, there's thought going into it. It's not just the worst stuff on the bottom shelf of all of these freaking grocery stores. If it's on the bottom shelf, okay, <laughs> these companies know that's in view of a toddler that will yeah. say, mommy, I want. And so it's filled with sugar and everything else that your kids should not be consuming. If you happen to have had a child with a woman who has all of that going for her, that's going to make you appreciate her. Be, I be kind. What about, one of the things that some of our guests have, have talked about with this, when you're in this situation, is it takes a lot of restraint to oh, yeah. not badmouth the other no. person. Yeah. And Step some, away from the keypad. When you're at your best, um, what is your advice for, you, you go through this thing in the courts and that's terrible, there's every reason, let's say you're entirely in the right, there's every reason to be like, oh, yeah. this has gone horribly wrong, this is not a good person that I have to deal with. But for your kid, you can't show that stuff, yeah. No, right. No. So how do you? How have you managed that? You know, at your best. When have you caught yourself? Like, what's your advice? What's your advice for that? Again, we just met each other sitting yeah. down at this. No, nah, it's a it's a cool connection. It's just. It's but like, yeah. I feel like I can see you've got a lot of sophistication about the way you think about your relationship. Um. And you've had some, you've, you know, well, one, you've already shared, you've had a hard court situation. So that sets things the, up. The one thing I could say that a guy can relate to that's logical is um, the greatest teller of the truth is time. And so when you're going through something, though, if you're so in the muck of it, you can't see 
that if your intentions are good, time is on your side. Now that's the thing right there. Yeah, that's, is that's great advice, wow. Intentions. And I say this for both parents. You know what your damn intentions are. I, I had a moment in court one day where the damn judge paused out the, the, the attorneys and said, so wait a minute, I, I just wanna make something clear. Um, so all three of these children are not his? And I'm like, I wanted to take every piece of paper on that and just fling it at his head. No, fool, one is mine, two come from another dude. Like two come from another, and we spent how many thousands of dollars for you to, to get this, right? Like, um, but, it, but obviously you show restraint in, in, in those moments because that's a monumental waste. And people think that these judges and these attorneys or whatever care. They don't. He's an accountant with a robe. <laughs> That's it. He goes into the back and his job is to figure out which one of you is hiding money. And if he doesn't see bruises on the kid, then he doesn't really care how you raise your child. So I want anybody that's in a relationship to value what it is to have another parent that's actually contributing and has good intentions. That's really, really important. I would say step away from the keypad. Anytime you're at your angriest, write it, leave it in a draft box. Don't send it. I guarantee you every time you do that, you wake up in the morning and either you'll want to rewrite it or you'll say, I don't even need to send that. So that, it took me a while to get to that process of every, insults and anger is such at our fingertips now. Yeah. Step away from the keep, like literally as soon as you feel yourself angry, it's like, oh, don't, don't, don't type, don't, don't, don't type. But I'm different, I'm actually a writer at heart. So sometimes I have, I have just volumes of, <laughs> of drafts that never got sent, but I needed to say it, I needed to express it. And, um, and over time, as the truths started to prevail more, the child is seeing things on their own, it happens. Your kids can see bad intentions and good intentions. And I say that not to attack women at all. I say that to attack guys too. Your kids can see from either parent bad intentions and good intentions. They can't express it when they're too young, but if you let them get to age 11 and 12 and 13 or whatever, they'll tell you straight out, I know you didn't do that for me. You did that just to hurt dad. And when you suddenly realize how smart they are, you have a different personality also that says, you will not tell me about myself. Hmm. And I will make you pay for telling me about myself. Whoa, now you're jeopardizing your whole relationship with your kid. Because kids know the truth and time is gonna tell the truth. I try to tell people, say, please stay away from Twitter. Please stay away from, from sending nasty emails. Please stay away from, um, from sending texts. You know, there's, they even have websites now that you can, you know, you can sign up for where, you know, I know Our Family Wizard was the one that I used, uh, where you don't even have to text the other parent. Um, you know, instead you send your message to this, you know, to this portal that acts as a kind of like a meeting place, a digital meeting place, essentially. And that might be necessary for you. I remember, you know, my daughter's mother tried to make that an issue. He won't receive text messages, but I was like, it's a bomb. I'm, I'm at work, I'm in meetings, I'm talking to people, and I get a novel that comes in telling me what I'm not. Hell no, I have this wonderful little block button right here, <laughs> and I'm done with that. And I had to hold my ground on that, unfortunately, because, and now we're in a place where nothing goes back and forth of the nasty nature, because now my daughter can advocate for herself, she's in middle school, et cetera, et cetera. So I saw that development coming and I just tell parents, please step away from the keypads, sleep on it, draft it if you need to, don't fire it off to the other side. Please don't take your fight to Twitter. That is the dumbest effing place for you. I don't care what's happened. Yeah. I don't care what's happened. If, if one of you went to Twitter first, and I did it, I'm guilty, I, I'm guilty, but we're talking like 12 years ago. You know? But I'm like, if one of you goes to Twitter, you're effing up. I don't care your gender, you're effing up. These people don't know you, they don't care. They're just there to yell in a digital form, fight, fight, fight. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna transition us to some fun. Okay. 
We've got uh, we've got a couple minutes left. I've got our I've got some rapid fire questions for us. We've oh, had, rapid fire! All yeah, right. so, just because you ask them fast, don't mean I gotta answer them fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, first up, what does masculinity mean to you? Woo! <laughs> but answer this quickly. Yeah. I'm measured like Obama. <laughs> I gotta talk to my team first. <laughs> what does masculinity mean to me? It means being able to open any jar in the house uh, that others cannot. It means being a protector. It means making the people around you, male or female, feel safe. Uh, masculinity means restraint. Love that. Restraint. Yeah. All right. What's the most dangerous thing you ever did as a child? I used to have this silly game where you would take a knife and you would try to go fast through your fingers. Oh yeah, I remember this. This is before the internet too, so I don't even know how this became popular. <laughs> yeah. Why everyone knows this game? Is it like in some Western film or something? It's like some John Ford showdown moment on, in the saloon. The dumbest activity to do with a steak knife, right, out of boredom. That's, prob that's probably... That's high on the list. I'm sure I could think of something else, but you uh, want me to answer you know. that. Could be worse. The steak, the, steak, the steak knife finger challenge, because your show hasn't come on yet. <laughs> your show hasn't come on. What's the most dangerous thing you've ever let your little girl do? You know, it's funny. This is weird. This was weird. My daughter used to walk on the back of couches and stuff, and she was in gymnastics class or whatever. And, you know, typically you're supposed to be like, hey, get down off the furniture or whatever. I'm a single dad and whatever. But I... I had an innate understanding of her balance. I knew when she was off balance and when she had found her balance. So I would let her walk on the backs of couches in any vacation home or whatever. And she used to love to do it, do it. And I was like, and I just instinctively knew. I was like, she's fine. It's always when you try to help that the, that the injury occurs. Right, <laughs> true. But, but, but again, it would be, I would see another person's kid doing something on the same level. I'm like, oh, you want to grab him? He's going to get hurt. Like, you could, just, you could just see somebody teetering. You could just see, you could, you could feel it. And this is not meant to necessarily go into the depths, but how have you most damaged your kid, either physically or mentally? Uh, Everybody drops in bed. So I'm sure there was, there, I, I faintly kind of remember one good time where she, she caught up. You know, and uh, oh, yeah. what happens is you scoop them up real so fast in your mind, it just didn't happen. Yeah. But, but it was nothing that, that we needed to go to a hospital over at all. The worst was, actually it wasn't me. My mom was ironing her clothes on a hotel bed. And then she unplugged the iron and left the iron on the bed. And then so my daughter started jumping around just being a kid. And yeah. then bloop on the bed, and the iron rolled over onto her arm. And it was like, ah, screaming for no reason. Like, what's going on? It was like, and the iron was still hot. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of those co parenting moments. And I'm looking at my mom, I'm like, you just cost me 10 grand. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. But luckily my daughter survived it, but that's probably the worst of it all, okay. is the, the all hot right. iron on the bed. <laughs> we've, had, we've, had, we've all had these things. <laughs> What's the most valuable thing you've learned from your kid? Man, your kid teaches you a capacity to love you just, you just don't even know is there. And you know that, just dad to dad. Yeah. You, don't even, you don't even know it's there. Yeah. The most valuable thing is to listen. None of us listen too well. A lot of us sometimes when we talk, we just wait for the other person to stop talking so we can start talking. But when you're dealing with your kid, especially in pivotal moments, you got to hear them and you got to hear the subtext and you got to hear the emotion behind what they're saying and what they're trying to communicate. I think my daughter has helped me on a path to become a better communicator. I was more reactionary before she got here. Whereas now I'm more observant and then I seek out immediately somebody else to talk to who I know will offer me sage advice or something that'll settle me down. She's helped me become a much better communicator and a better uh, listener. You're right, Every, that's a lesson everybody, yeah. everybody can learn.
What did your dad teach you about God? Ooh. My dad had a, a, a tough relationship with religion because his parents were overly religious. So because you asked that question specifically about my father, that's, there's, there's a lot of depth to that. I've always believed in God. I, 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 my faith is very strong. Um, but my dad would have to stay in church for hours upon hours upon hours. His parents were religious zealots. His father was a preacher. Even when my dad wanted to play football in high school, his mom said she had to talk to God about it. God didn't get back to her. So he never played football. And so he kind of resented the church um, and would wrestle with that because my mom had a very clear understanding of who she was as a woman. And she, we had quite a few Sundays where she was like, I'm taking Jaleel to church, and if you don't want to come, that's fine. And back then, that was when the, the Lakers and the Celtics would play each other on a Sunday. And, oh. and Byron Scott would show up at the church, and so we'd wish him off, wish him well as he <laughs> went to the Great Western Forum to beat Larry Bird or whatever. So, yeah, I got great church stories, man. <laughs> I, had a, I had Showtime Lakers in my church, too. And we didn't have no money, but still, I had a Showtime Laker in my church, which was the coolest thing ever. My relationship with God, man, I just... I. I formed it more on my own. I knew when my daughter got here that God had a greater purpose for me because I got to take care of her. What do you want written on your gravestone? Oh, man. Nah, I'm, I'm, I haven't dealt with, with, with my gravestone stuff yet. I'm, I'm too clever for that. I want to be like frozen with like Han Solo or something. I, want, I, I need something sexy and above ground. The whole idea of going into a box after all this and just being delivered to worms is just not, that ain't it. So, I'm so your catchphrase is not making it on the Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> you know what? It's like, now's the time when I get Jaleel to punch me in the face by saying, did I do that? We'll be on, on your gravestone. On my gravestone? <laughs> over, over my dead body. <laughs> over my dead body. I mean, it's actually a pretty good gravestone. I can't, I, I, look, I can't, I can't fault you. I I'm just going to say it. Not I, everybody's works. I can't fault you. I can't. Listen, I love a good pun. I love the comedic <laughs> timing. I left it open. You had to go for the steal. But I'm like, no, 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 no. I know I'm going to be able to do better than that. I don't know what it is. You I, got I a good, you've got a good backup, though. You know, I just, I got to be real, though, man. I just, <laughs> pandemic for me was odd because it felt like halftime of my life. I just feel like there's so much, so much more for me to do still. Yeah. And, and it's not going to look like anything that I've done in the past. I have no idea, seriously, dog, what I would put on a grave. I just know it's got to be something sexy and above ground. <laughs> I ask this. This is our last question. I've had such a good time with this conversation, man. It's been a blast. Uh, thank you, God. You know, we're called Dad Saves America because I believe that as a man, being a dad is maybe the most heroic thing you can do. Yeah. And it has this ripple effect out from your family to your community, and I think ultimately to the country. Yeah. And, and you're an actor, so this is something that I think has a special resonance. What do you see as your role in the American story, in that big story? I like uniting people. I kind of had to, in, in examining all, my, all the work that I've ever done and the people that I've worked with, the faces and the races are so eclectic that I love sending messages that unite people universally, regardless of your religion, your race, your gender, any of that. It's just a message that could serve anybody. And that's what we did do with shows way better yeah. back then. Is everybody loved yeah. everybody loved you yeah, everybody. in your show. I appreciate that. And it's like, but it's like all of this niche programming now is so proud of only speaking to such a small group of people that can identify with that program. They're so proud, of, they're, and they're so proud of it too. They're like, they're like, I only talk to my audience. I'm so inclusive <laughs> that I've left everyone out. I'm so inclusive, man, there you go, I'm so right. And I'm like, for me, I'm like, one of the coolest things about me, what it is to, to not about me, but what it is to be me. I love stepping off an airplane in another country having no clue how well I've syndicated there. And I just discover who knows me. I love that. That's, what, that's 
probably one of the greatest joys about what it is to have been me and to continue to be me is just stepping off again in these different countries. So I want the work that I continue to do, whatever it is, to be able to spread with universal messages so that as I travel the globe, I can continue to connect with people who are from Houston or New York or Lebanon or Australia. Like, you do remember in this medium, our goal is to just share positive messages with people around the globe. I'm still really passionate about breaking down any global stereotypes that are associated with black men, that are associated with a dad. That's why I was drawn to talk, talk to you, that, uh, that there's still a place for a man to be considered the head of a household without being a domineering figure. I think it's extremely important that women have a functional relationship with their fathers or make peace with what their relationship with their father will never be and understand that. I think that's huge. So giving that gift to my daughter, is that's, that's been my greatest joy right there. I don't know, like I said, going forward, I just like to be a voice for uniting and breaking down stereotypes. I think, I think in the future, nothing is going to look on the outside the way it thinks and moves on the inside. Hmm. I, had a, I had a brother the other day who's a, a designer, dope. He's an amazing graphic designer and an, an e-commerce entrepreneur. He was talking about bucket list stuff. I said, I want to see the Northern Lights. I want to go to Norway. He was like, really? He says, crazy, I'm, I'm, um, I'm learning Norwegian because I'm, um, I'm going to go to architecture school there in three years. And I'm like, wait a minute, you're moving? If you were to see this black couple, you would never imagine that their plans in three years are to move to Norway so that her husband can study architecture because he just has a thing. Apparently, they have some very prestigious architecture school there, and, and he's moved by it. So I'm saying on the outside, yeah. they don't look like any stereotype. When you look at a person, stop judging them based on boomer stereotypes. Knock that crap off. You don't know how somebody's thinking and moving in this day and age, man. Well, I think this conversation proves a lot of those points. Jaleel, this has been an incredible conversation. Thanks for being on Dad Saves America. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs>